Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Shishir. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about compression strategies for 3D point clouds today. Yeah, so uh, Wikipedia defines uh, point clouds as a set of coordinates, uh, a set of points in a 3D coordinate system. So uh, basically these are captured through sensors and they, it's, a, it's a good way to render 3D objects. Oh no, it's still on the same slide. <laughs> yeah, so each point has uh, three coordinates, the X, Y, Z. And as well as attributes, so things like color and uh, illumination, intensity, and the no, I'll do it. It's okay. <laughs> so yeah, the reason you need to compress it is so. For example, in applications like geographic information systems, there was uh, one system that was developed by a company called Umbra 3D, where they mapped an 800 square kilometer area in California, and that data set had 17.7 billion points, and uncompressed, it was around 240 GB. So it's very important to compress uh, point clouds so you can render and transmit them. Here. Yeah. So uh, I'll be uh, dividing it into two types. So one is static and the other is time varying. So the compression strategies can broadly be divided into these two. So uh, yeah, because the challenges are different. So another way of rendering point clouds would be to convert them to polygon meshes before you render them. And here there are two types. So there is a progressive and single rate. So progressive allows you to uh, decode a lower resolution image just with a partial bit stream, uh, uh, yeah, a partial bit stream, and uh, yeah, and then you have single rate. The other thing is you can directly render them as uh, uh, the 3D point clouds themselves without going to meshes, and this is uh, less computationally expensive, and it's also uh, more flexible for uh, this sort of progressive decoding. So uh, a popular framework that's used and it's referred to in a lot of the research papers is a point cloud library. It's a large open source project and it has a lot of functions to display, render, filter and even compress point clouds. So uh, I'll start with static point clouds first. So uh, an example application of static point clouds would be in geographic information systems. Uh, the, one of the challenges here is that the data sets are so huge because they, these are geographical areas that are captured by planes, drones and uh, rotating scanning stations. So to load them onto memory before you can do any rendering is a huge challenge. So I give you that example of that one data set that they collected. So the most popular solution that people used was a pre-processing step where uh, you create different levels of detail. So you start by uh, the lowest level, uh, at the lowest level of detail, you render it in chunks and this serves as the input for the next level of detail. So uh, this pre-processing step helps you uh, load it onto memory. And traditional methods like uh, removing occluded points that are hidden behind uh, objects is not very effective and it's difficult to compute at the start. So yeah, the other category is time varying point clouds. Uh, the example applications are uh, 3D immersive uh, video and uh, video games. So yeah, this has become popular with new sensors coming up like the Kinect and uh, the, as the computation power of commodity hardware goes up, it's uh, more suited for these kind of applications. No, it's okay. Yeah, so uh, they basically enable free viewpoint rendering. So you can, uh, there, there's no fixed camera. And uh, you can also compositely render different uh, virtual objects in, uh, or different objects in the virtual world. So, uh, it's, it's okay. Yeah, so the, the thing about uh, static point clouds was the compression is basically geometric and spatial. So they, these are uh, compressed one frame at a time. But when you talk about time varying, you even have the temporal aspect. So you can exploit the temporal redundancies based on the correlation between uh, subsequent frames. So uh, that's uh, one extra uh, way that you can compress time varying point clouds. So yeah, a popular data structure that they use is the awk tree. Basically how this works is you take a bounding box around your frame and you keep dividing it into eight parts. So this is like a 3D version of the 2D quad tree. And uh, basically you keep dividing it as long as you don't have any empty uh, cells or a cell which does not have a voxel in it. So uh, you could also visualize it as a tree as it's shown here. And uh, you can encode this. So for example, this level where only these two have uh, voxels in them, you would encode as 00100010. So this is uh, the occupancy coding. And the decoder can create the whole tree just with the occupancy codes. Uh, 
And this data structure is preferred because it's very conducive to creating different levels of detail. So at each level of the tree could be uh, one level of detail. Yeah, so uh, I'll talk about how uh, the, uh, the compression is done. So the first step would be uh, removing outliers and creating a bounding box. So one solution which they showed for removing outliers is uh, a, a spherical radius. So if there's any point that does not have more than k neighbors within a radius r around it, you just remove those as outliers. So uh, and the other thing is you need to encode the attributes efficiently. So uh, the one solution that they used for the occupancy codes was they did a bit reordering to reduce the entropy within these codes. So that way it was uh, more efficient to encode them and it took less space. And for colors, they just encoded the difference between two macro blocks in the same tree. Uh, yeah, so this is how you do the, the, the static part. So the, this is called the intra frame, where you uh, encode one frame at a time. The other part, because it's time varying, is uh, where you predict subsequent frames. So yeah, this, this is called the inter frame coding. So uh, how this is done is uh, one technique which they showed was called uh, uh, where they used an XOR operation on the occupancy codes. So just the geometric part you can predict, but not the attributes like color. So they just did an XOR operation on the bitstream on the occupancy code bitstream, and this doesn't work well when there's a lot of motion in the frame, and it's just for the geometric part of the information. Another solution that they showed was. Uh, uh, where the compression was done uh, using, uh, basically they divide it into macro blocks and they code a, a, a rigid transform. So they use something called an iterative uh, collecting point uh, algorithm where you find a rigid transform that will take you from one macro block to the next, in the next frame. So yeah, th these are two of the approaches that they used. Uh, yeah, so this is what I was talking about, the bit reordering. And uh, some of the other studies that they showed were uh, where they encoded it for specific applications. So they optimized it just for one. It's not generalizable. So they did a study based on the level of, level of detail required for one application. It was a subjective study. And everything was optimized based on that. So yeah, this is the iterative closest point that I just told you about. Uh, and the thing is, for these different uh, applications of point clouds, there are very different evaluation criteria. So for the time varying applications that I told you about, you talk about the geometric distortion versus the bit rate, and uh, also the algorithmic complexity. So there are two ways to measure this distortion. Uh, there's also studies where they used a subjective evaluation. So they asked people to tell them if they can perceive a degrading, uh, a degrading quality in the compressed uh, frame versus the uncompressed frame. And there are additional criteria. So for applications like teleimmersive video, uh, you need to have parallelizability. You need to have a low computation cost of both encoding and decoding, because it's happening live. It's sort of like a conference of uh, a virtual uh, or a naturalistic representation of you in a virtual room. So yeah, the, those are the additional criteria. Uh, scope for future work and knowledge gaps. Uh, there's a lot of scope within the inter-frame coding, the predictive part of it. There are a lot of restrictions on the way they do it right now. So first they filter the frames. So they only consider frames where the bounding box of the subsequent frame fits inside the current frame. And then they only see that there's not too much contrast within the colors and the number of points within the frame are the same. So uh, they impose a lot of restrictions on the frames that they consider. So one way to improve the performance would be to increase the number of frames that are used for prediction or that are sent to prediction to the interpredictive coding instead of intrapredictive coding. And we can also improve the algorithm that they've used. So right now it's quite simplistic with the XOR and even with uh, the rigid transform that they encode. So if, uh, because they only deal with macro blocks, but if we expand that to the entire frame, then uh, we might be able to use uh, pattern recognition techniques to sort of predict the next frame better. Yeah, uh, that was the talk. Thanks for listening.